Hello, everyone, and welcome to your final webinar in our series of Lodi Rules Management Plan webinars. Today, you have myself, Stephanie Bolton, the Lodi Rules Sustainable Wine Grain Director from the Lodi Wine Grape Commission, and also Steve, Steve Kwasnick. With Wilbur Ellis Company, I am a PCA, but sometimes affectionately called a pesticide hussy. <laughs> <laughs> Let's not take this too seriously. <laughs> I think we're in for a treat today. Okay, so let's see. So we will go ahead and get started. We'll be turning our video off now, and you will be sharing the screen with us lucky so that we. For you. Well, lucky for you, not having to look at me, Stephanie. <laughs> Stephanie would be all right. <laughs> all right. So. In case you missed the first three webinars on the sale chapter management plans, which were the human resources plan, the ecosystem pest management plan, the powdery mildew management plan, the soil borne management plan, the and the monitoring records, you don't have to worry because the webinars were recorded and those can be viewed at lodigrowers.com under the education, videos, presentations, and handouts tab. And that's also where all webinar handouts are available. And then if you have your little screen that is um, part of this webinar, the GoToWebinar mini screen, you should be able to download the handout. It's attached um, for you at that screen. But if you can't figure out how to do that, that's okay. It is also going to be posted online by the end of today. So thank you very much for your participation this afternoon. And please let us know what worked and didn't work for you so that we can improve. We've really been appreciating all of the kind comments that have been coming through. So my email address is stephanie at lodiwan.com. And as a reminder, please be sure that you're reading the introductory material in your Lodi Rules Standards Binder, which is pages 1 through 6. And that intro material explains a lot about the standards and about who to contact with what questions you may have. And as you prepare for your audit, make sure to use the audit prep checklist, which is tab 10 in the binder, and it's also available for download at lodirules.com. So if after reading the audit prep checklist, you're still unsure of whether or not something in particular counts as a verification document, then contact Heather Muser, the auditor. And if your great buyer has strong ties to the Lodi Rules program, they may be willing to spend some time helping you with the program, too. Perfect. So today we'll be covering three management plans and monitoring records, and that is the weed management plan, the vertebrate management plan, and the spray dust drift management plan. And as a special bonus, because I think I might have also written down that we would cover the sprayer duster maintenance plan, which is letter rule 6.24, we will do at the end of this webinar, we'll do an on-the-fly sprayer duster maintenance plan writing and kind of show you the process from start to finish um, for you. So that's a special bonus for today. Now this you're ought to be very interesting. <laughs> so here's some general plan writing tips. If this is your first year in the Lodi Rules program, keep your plan simple and more universal. Add the corresponding Lodi Rule standard and title at the top of each plan for easy filing and organization. Every plan has kind of a basic structure where you'll, you will list visions and goals at the top. You describe your current situation, if applicable, and then you'll list your overall management strategies. You want to use the headings in the standard itself and organize the plan around those headings. So what I mean by the headings and the standard, you can see them here in the weed management plan, it's these components. So your management goals, is it a heading? Your monitoring techniques and records another heading. So you want to organize your plan around each of those components listed in the standard. And don't worry if you haven't written anything longer than an email for several years because bullet points are acceptable. Always include a section at the end of the plan for a plan review and update schedule with lines for dates and signatures. Um, please review your management plans at your annual manager's meeting, which is Lodi Rule Standard 1.3, or at another time. 
and every year it's a good idea to focus on one area to improve for each plan or to focus on a few plans because you'll really get the most use out of your plans if you use them. Isn't that right, Steve? Absolutely correct. And, and I would say the advice I've given some of my clients when they write these plans is, is really don't try, to write, uh, don't try to write a novel. Keep it simple. Keep it flexible. After all, they are plans. Um, it's not a roadmap. I, I think of these things a lot like I think about budgets. Um, not that budgets are written to be broken, but but there are guidelines, and we expect uh, we expect things to change and maybe alter from the plan. Uh, so keep it simple. Put enough detail in there so that at least you've provided some guidance to yourself. But realize that things things can always change. Definitely. And make sure that you're, um, you're using your employees for input on your plan and asking them for um, advice and, and seeing uh, maybe some suggestions for improvement in the, in the different management categories. And I, one other thing I was going to think of, because I, I, I've seen many growers handle this different ways. Just remember, this is your plan. It's not our plan. It's not the auditor's plan. This is your plan. And for instance, I'm looking at one growers here that um, for the management plan goals, and his goals are two: uh, reduce the number of herbicide sprays that we apply each year, and number two, to apply an integrated approach to attacking weeds on my property. Very straightforward, very simple. Um, looking at another one, very similar: minimize the potential for drift offsite is one of his goals. Um, Maximize the effectiveness of each pesticide and fungicide by using an effective pest management and spray program. Uh, like I said, just remember, it doesn't have to be, and, and both of these are done in bullet point format. Yeah, so it doesn't have to be extremely detailed and super specific. So let's go ahead and start looking at our weed management plan. We will have time for questions at the end of each plan and at the end of the webinar. To ask us a question, we can't hear you, but we can type in a question in the questions and um, the little questions tab on the GoToWebinar mini screen, and then we will get those questions answered. All right, so we're going to start by reading you 6.19. The farming operation has a written and implemented weed management plan containing the following components management goals. Monitoring techniques and record keeping, control measures, herbicide resistance avoidance strategies, and a plan review and update schedule. So, here is a general example of a weed management plan. We have the loadout rule standard number at the top, and we tell when the plan was written originally and also give the date of when it was last updated. And this is important for. Um, really for management of your, <laughs> of your management plans because you want to keep track of, of when they were updated so you don't know if, so you know when it happened. A lot of companies also like to include their logo at the top or at the bottom of the plan. Thank you for pausing. I was going to interject right there that um, the, uh, when you're talking about when it was written and when it was updated, um, you know, depending on what your motivation is, and, and we realize there's many growers out there that their motivation is to uh, is to apply for the certification and receive the certification and never to look at it again. And well, that's okay. That, that's still better than not doing it all. Uh, we tend to look at this as partly a management tool, and like you suggested, that we confer with uh, with employees and at, at all levels. Um, with the plan so they're aware of what we're trying to accomplish and it becomes a good educational tool within within the company as well. So um, like I say, you can do the minimums and certainly be certified and I won't think any less of you quite honestly, but uh, but I think if it's done correctly it can, uh, it can help lay out uh, strategy and be a good educational tool within your farming company. And a good record keeping history also. Absolutely. So we start out with our goals. Here's our goals. We strive to make wise, environmentally conscious, socially responsible, and economically feasible weed management decisions based on current technologies. We pay close attention to emerging and invasive weeds, 
follow label instructions on herbicides, rotate chemistries, and employ non-chemical control as efforts to reduce resistance buildup in pathogen populations when possible. Employees are trained in recognition of weeds. When possible, spot treatments are used. So this was a really easy plan to, I copied over from the insect and mite pest management plan that we went over at the last webinar. And this one's very similar. So that might be a good idea if you're writing all of your plans this year. This is an easy one to copy over from insect and mite and just change, um, change some of the wording. So, I like this a lot better. You've done a good job because when we started doing this however many years ago, we were just kind of running blind. <laughs> That's why this looks much better than what we did. <laughs> oh, thank you. And so then I copied and pasted the next part, the monitoring technique you see up here. I copied that and used that as my next heading. So monitoring techniques and record keeping. The PCA visually monitors the vineyard for weeds at least once every 10 days during the growing season, May through harvest, and keeps written records, which are then transferred to us via email upon request. And this sentence corresponds with Lodi Rule Standard 6.20. Weed monitoring occurs both within the vineyard block and around the edges. We also train all employees on weed recognition as they spend a lot of time in the vineyard and may spot a weed issue before the PCA. Our own employees monitor the vineyards for weeds at least once per month during the winter, and we keep written records in our files from those months. In general, we try to follow these UC IPM weed monitoring guidelines. And this is a hyperlink, so when you get this handout um, either later today or if you're able to download it from the GoToWebinar, you're welcome to use that ECIPM weed monitoring guidelines as you write your plan. And I want to mention that this website is also included in your companion information, which is given to you in your Lodi Rule Standards binder, or if you have the PDF copy of the standards, that companion information contains references and resources which are helpful. And I wanted to show you how those are helpful here. So here I just copied and pasted some of the UC IPM weed monitoring guidelines, which I thought were appropriate. And then kind of put them into our, my, I, I kind of put them into my own words. So I said, survey the vineyard in late winter to identify winter annuals, and again in summer after perennials and summer annuals have germinated. Pay particular attention to perennials, sketch a diagram of the vineyard, and mark areas where perennials are found. A handheld GPS unit also works well for recording locations of perennials. Check for regrowth of perennials a few weeks after, cu after cultivation. So I think you get the picture. Let me picture. for a second, yeah. because this is all wonderful. <laughs> and, uh, and we do use GPS to mark locations of, of pests, but, but don't feel intimidated by all of this. Your records could be as simple as a yellow pad or a, or a, a day planner where you keep these where you keep these notes and records as well. Um, it can be as high tech or as low tech as you want. And a lot of people get intimidated by some of this. Um, Stephanie's putting all this out to give you food for thought to put together your own plan. But once again, I'll remind you, it is your plan. So right. fair enough. Yes, yeah. totally, totally. And usually the And we've made that as simple with, with our own scouts and PCAs with my company. Uh, we've just uh, put together a simple spreadsheet so that, uh, and we have columns for weeds and vertebrate pests and, and all of these so that it's just part of our weekly scouting activities. Yes, yeah. and that's the easiest for the yeah. 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 time for your audit, for sure. Okay, so then the next heading, control measures. We maintain a healthy cover crop between every vineyard row, which naturally outcompetes some of the weeds for space. Underneath the vines, we use a pre-emergent herbicide mix once per year in the early spring. In some cases, we also mechanically remove the weeds. And then just as an... I'm, I'm okay. saying, and this, this is also a good place that <clears throat> in many cases, pre, in most cases, Pre-emergent control once a year isn't probably adequate weed control, so this is your option to to under control measures to maybe state what kind of what you would use for your perennials, what you would use for weed escapes in the late summer, early fall, 
uh, or whatever timing you're, you're choosing. Sorry. Yeah, totally. <laughs> and then um, just as an option, I put in here this table where you could annually talk about what weeds you found in the summer and the winter, and then what herbicides you use, so you could prove that you were rotating your chemistries and kind of just to keep track of rotating your herbicide chemistries. You do not have to have this table in your plan. It's just yeah, while you're doing it, you might as well write some of the history down. So then herbicide resistance avoidance strategies. Herbicide resistance actually went to an herbicide resistance management meeting down at the World Ag Expo this year. And, and everyone at the meeting, they asked us, you know, how important is herbicide resistance management? And we were like, that is not high on our priority list. We're worried about labor issues and, and all kinds of other things. But it's still important, right, hopefully Steve? Hopefully if you yes, hopefully if you have a good PCA or if you're managing this yourself, you take all of that in into uh, into account. I mean, we certainly use different pre-emergence with different modes of action to help pick up whatever particular weeds we have in the field. We'll use different modes of action for post-emergence. So um, if, if you have a reasonably clean field, you should be thinking about resistance management. Even though it's not a high priority, it's easily managed. Yeah, it's, it's important. For us PCAs and probably for you too, it's easily managed. You just have to think about it. Yes, and we're lucky about that right now, aren't we? So, Here's um, what we wrote for that. We rotate the mode of action for these herbicides according to HRAC and follow some of their best management practices for preventing herbicide resistance, which include employing cultural, mechanical, and chemical controls and mixing at least three herbicide chemistries in one application. And then I added in a link to this um, HRAC website. If you, this isn't a link that you would copy and paste into your plan, but this is for you if you want to look at their information and add any of that into your plan. And even if you don't add it into the plan, you can at least use that information to help as a decision-making tool to uh, uh, decide which herbicides to use exactly. or if to use herbicides. What you do. Exactly. For sure. For sure. And then you always want to have your plan review and update schedule. So it says this plan will be reviewed on an annual basis with management and field workers in February and a review date. And then signatures and written names of all present. Okay, we just got a note here. Someone just called. Your mic is cutting out about half the time. Not sure you can fix it now. Okay, so that is because my voice is so high. Because I was when I was little, and what happens is Steve's beautiful deep voice, when it changes over from his voice to my voice, you'll have a little bit of a delay. So I do apologize for that, and we'll try to pause between after he talks and I talk. It's just the microphone adjusting. I was waiting to watch your eyes so I could pause long enough. So <laughs> excuse us, this might sound a little awkward, but we will try to, uh, to pause for a second or so in between. Fair enough. Just like that. <laughs> Hopefully that was better. <laughs> okay. Are there any questions on that weed management plan? If so, go ahead and type your question in. And if not, we will keep going with the vertebrate management plan. Okay. We do not see any questions. So 6.21, the vertebrate management plan. The farming operation has a written and implemented vertebrate management plan containing the following components. Management goals, species of concern, monitoring strategies, control strategies, and a plan review and update schedule. So again, you just copy those components and those are the headings in the organization of your plan and that is what the auditor is looking for too. So here's a general example. Here, again, we have our Lodi Rule Standard 6.21 Vertebrate Management Plan, and then you are supposed to always say when it was written and when it was updated. So it was written on 4-25-2017, and we'll say it's updated maybe in the future on May 1st. I guess it hasn't been updated yet, so if you just wrote it, you wouldn't say updated. Okay, 
Goals. We seek to minimize the impact of vertebrate pests on the economic value of our vineyard operation. Employees are trained in recognition of vertebrate pests and their symptoms slash presence indicators. When possible, cultural means of control and biocontrol are used. Speak. Yes. <laughs> Ahead. I'm already reading ahead. Go, go ahead, Stephanie. Yeah. Okay. Species of concern. Ground squirrels, pocket gophers, meadow voles. Perhaps in your operation you may also want to include rabbits or deer. I've even heard beavers can be a concern sometimes. When I lived in Georgia we had someone who um, had a bear come and eat their whole vineyard at one time. So um, make sure you include all of your species of concern. Absolutely. And we've seen all of those. And, uh, we've seen all of those. But you may include birds if you're in an area where uh, where bird feeding is is an issue. Um, strangely, I've seen woodpeckers pecking holes in drip hose, and and that requires some management thought. Rattlesnakes, uh, name your poison. They they all have vertebra, which makes them vertebrate brits. So uh, think a little outside the box here. <laughs> Okay, and monitoring strategies. The PCA visually monitors the vineyard for vertebrates at least once every 10 days during the growing season, May to harvest, and keeps written records, which are then transferred to us via email upon request, which matches Lodi Rule Standard 6.22. Vertebrate monitoring occurs both within the vineyard block and around the edges. We also train all employees on vertebrate identification as they spend a lot of time in the vineyard and may spot an issue before the PCA. So you can see how some of this wording, once you've written a lot of plans, you're on chapter six, you kind of get used to the wording and you can really copy and paste some of your same ideas and thoughts from other plans. So I included in monitoring strategies some clues that we train employees to look for, which are holes in the ground, chewing of drip irrigation lines, and soil mounds. You know, backing up just a little bit, talking about the copying and pasting, and don't be afraid if you have friends out there. Certainly we've done a lot of that over the years where early on when we were kind of, everybody was struggling with how to write these plans, uh, I know I helped some, some clients with write some plans and then we shared it with everybody and, and we did copy and paste and then customized obviously. We, we didn't want uh, erroneous information. It wasn't just about passing the test. It was, but it certainly saved a lot of groundwork. I mean, saved a lot of work and formatting and all of those things. So don't be afraid to share. Yes. And then we hope that all of you who are going through the Lodi Rules Program for the first time this year will then next year be um, in a great position to help people out because all of your plan writing and your audit will be fresh in your mind. So we do hope that some of that mentorship happens naturally within our community. All right, so um, here is a table that I just pasted in and it's from a vertebrate pest article written by Desley Wisson and Gregory Juicy, and the link to that is um, here on the handout. And this was just um, some examples of the different species signs and management strategies for or control measures for um, those those um, vertebrates to give you an idea of what some things you might want to consider. So again, you don't need to copy and paste this table into your plan. This is just some information to help you while you're writing your plans. So control strategies. Again, these are just bullet points. Remember, you don't always have to write in paragraph form. 
So in our large vineyard blocks, greater than 50 acres, we have one wooden owl box for every 25 acres, which corresponds to Lodi Rule Standard 6.23. In the small vineyard blocks, less than 50 acres, we have one wooden owl box per 15 acres. These boxes are mounted on metal poles to prevent predation of the owls and cleaned following manufacturer instructions once per year when they are empty. You could simply just say that you use owl boxes. That's okay, too. <laughs> I just was trying to sneak in a little owl box education. That sounds like, a, like I'm putting Stephanie down. I, <laughs> my problem is I'm not a good typist, so I keep everything very brief. But, but yeah, you could just say I use owl boxes to, to manage rodents. And... Like I said, once again, this is your own. This is your own plan. So trapping. If you look down at the lower bullet points, I actually have one customer that has quite a deer problem, and uh, and uh, fish and game wildlife has allowed him to har harvest some deer. So uh, that those things are all options too. This is truly integrated pest management. Yeah. yeah. And you include a space to write your review date and signatures and names of all the people present. Again, I'm, you know, I'm looking what Stephanie's done here, but also on the ones we've done under the review process, we actually included this line. Uh, we will review and update our plan every year to make changes as needed. We will also review the following questions. Which vertical press persisted? Which methods were effective? Were there any side effects, and what was the cost-benefit ratio? So, it, keep that in mind. That's something else to give a little thought to. I like the fact that Stephanie has put a due date on the review <laughs> process. That's always a good idea, which we did not do. But, um, but anyhow, that is a good idea. Yeah, and so if you added some questions in, that would kind of guide your review process. So you weren't just sitting around the table thinking, okay, well, what are we supposed to talk about here? It's already written there, and it kind of makes you talk about some things. You know, doing a cost-benefit ratio probably isn't the easiest thing to do, so that would be um, some accountability there. All right, and I just want to remind you that if you want to hear more about anything that Steve's saying today, just like in the other webinars, feel free to email me and I can get you in touch with him. Right, Steve? Absolutely. All right, so we're going to move on to Lodi Rule Standard 6.2. Oh, I'm sorry. If you had any questions, please type those in. I did not see any questions come through, so we're going to move on. But if you um, have questions, remember, you can also ask them at the end. Lodi Rule Standard 6.27, Spray Dust Drift Management Plan. The farming operation has a written and implemented spray dust drift management plan containing the following components. Spray dust drift management goals, identified sensitive areas, good neighbor policies, established buffers, pesticide rate selection guidelines, equipment operation, weather condition considerations, timing of application, drift reduction adjuvants, and a plan review and update schedule. So this particular plan has a lot of components to it, but you'll see as we show you this example, you might only need to write a sentence or two under each of those components, and it's also okay to combine more than one component into a heading. And um, I do want to make you aware, even if you're using a custom applicator, you still need to have a spray dust drift management plan, and you might want to ask your custom applicator or you should ask your custom applicator to help you with the plan if you do not do your spraying, right, Steve? I think more than that, I think you should talk to your custom applicator and make him aware that drift management is very important to you and uh, share your plan with him. And of course, or you can, or her, exactly. <laughs> I can think of any female applicators, but I'm sure they're out there. Anyway, share your plan with them and, and of course, discuss the importance and, and perhaps edit your plan based on that discussion. 
I love it. All right, so here's an example. Lodi rule standard, you know, you have your, your title at the top, standard 6.27 spray dust drift management plan. You tell when it was written and updated, and you start out with your goals. Goals, to use the minimum number of pesticide applications per year while maintaining effective, cost-efficient disease prevention and control. To optimize the physical application of pesticides, maximize, which means maximizing the amount of active ingredient applied to the target location. To prevent drift incidents, nobody wants that. Mm -hmm and to stay informed of current spray technologies which may improve application and reduce drift. So you are free to use any of these goals in your plan writing. It's okay, I, I wrote them, um, so I don't mind at all. And you, um, you know, just customize them like Steve was saying to whatever you want and add in your own goals. Correct. So what are your goals on your plan, Steve? Much simpler than that. Slash sulfur dust to drift into sensitive areas. Um, for example, residential dwellings, roads, schools, adjacent crops. Number two, reduce the number of pesticide applications we perform in the season. And we kept it very simple in this little plan. Um, so then we'll move on. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, okay. Because it's different. It is different. Yeah. Um, um, something else I would just put out here for to think about, and, I, and I'm not so sure it should be included or shouldn't, but perhaps if you have neighbors, and, and we were recently we've seen drift incidents from non-grape fields, herbicides, particularly into grape vineyards, and uh, you know, I'm not so sure that drift management just uh, pertains to, to our own applications. It may be, maybe it's worth thinking about our neighbors' applications and at least having that discussion with the wheat grower next door about how sensitive grapes are to some of the herbicides he's putting on this time of year. It's, that is a great point, so why don't we add, that was a really good well, point. I'm not positive it belongs here, but it's, well, it's still a good practice. We could put, to prevent drift incidents, both um, stemming from our vineyards and into our vineyards. I like it. And this might be, you know, just brainstorming here, it might be particularly important if uh, if you're growing organic grapes and drift becomes from a neighbor becomes a, a true economic issue. So something to think about. It is your plan. That's really a really good idea. And it's way better to be proactive in that case than reactive. Which, uh, after all, is the whole idea of these plans. Totally. Yeah. So we've got a good teamwork on this team. <laughs> okay, the next component of your plan, identified sensitive areas. So in this case, it's neighbor's home located east of the Cabernet Sauvignon block on Lester Road. And on our plan, we just said, please refer to our environmental survey for this vineyard, uh, which is also positive, possible. But Keep in mind, um, lots of areas that could be sensitive. It could be a neighboring home. Well, heck, it may be your own home inside of a piece of property. If you, know, uh, you certainly don't want anything toxic floating around your own house. It may be waterways. It may be vernal pools. It may be um, you know, roadways. A busy road could be a slow road. Uh, if a school bus is driving by, it could be schools, could be churches, daycares. All of those things uh, are areas that are of concern. Totally. Yeah. So good neighbor policies. We maintain personal, friendly communication with our neighbors and the community at large in regards to pesticide application. We visited our neighbors mentioned above and let them know that we need to use pesticides to stay in business, but that we carefully manage the applications to reduce drift, and if they have any questions or concerns, we are open to communication. We all, it's a good idea to give your neighbors your phone number or the email address, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, just to finish off with that, uh, yes, definitely, because, and, and it's a good idea to communicate them with, if, whenever possible, especially there, there are some neighbors out there that uh, are not real fond of any pesticide application. So the more you can communicate, the better, and, and a, and a well-placed bottle of wine at Christmas time is never a bad idea. 
Exactly. And if they, they're usually anti-pesticide because they don't understand pesticide use, and so you could be the person with the difference there. So I'm um, just going to continue reading this one. We also invite the neighbors to our annual harvest dinner in the vineyard. And in the community, we attend local grower meetings where drift issues are discussed and represent responsible use of pesticides. Good. I don't know what to add. <laughs> awesome. Okay, established buffers. There is a 30-foot buffer present along all roadways. Uh, I think that's probably a minimum. And uh, also, most of these things can be managed. Even though there's a 30-foot buffer, we, we all know how pesticides and especially dust formulations do drift. So in addition to your buffers, don't forget that. That may not be enough, and, and I think Stephanie's probably addressed it farther down here, but wind direction and uh, traffic patterns on roads and uh, um, uh, church hours on Sunday mornings are all things to be considered uh, when making pesticide applications and avoiding consequential drift. Totally. So pesticide rate selection guidelines um, it can be as simple as this. We follow label recommendations and apply only the amount needed for effective control based upon years of experience, canopy vigor, and talking with our PCA and other growers. Yes. So you don't have to have to um, say, you know, any further detail than that, because you could get pretty detailed in that. You can get very detailed in all of these, and I, I guess it's if, if you love writing, keep going. <laughs> uh, if you don't, you could probably cut all of this in half and still be reasonably effective. And useful. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so equipment operations. Sprayers are properly maintained and calibrated. See the sprayer duster maintenance plan, letter rule 6.24. Sprayers and dusters are turned off at the end of the vineyard rows as appropriate. All applicators are licensed and trained above and beyond what is required by law. We trust the applicators to make wise decisions regarding pesticide applications. For example, if they determine that a spray needs to be delayed to reduce drift, then we support that decision. And, have a, and we have a system of checks and balances in place for added safety and risk reduction. And this is where I think worker education really plays a role. Um, Stephanie's mentioned a few things you can do here is turning off at row ends. Uh, in some cases it's a matter of only spraying, uh, not not having both sides of the sprayer turned on, only spraying into the vineyard for a row or two. Um, like I said, time, time of day, generally where we have sensitive highways, we'll try to to do our sulfur spray applications at two or three in the morning and not during rush hour traffic, uh, the, those things. But that's where where uh, reaching out to your employees and sprayer operations is very important. Yeah, and keeping them informed. Exactly. So some weather con condition considerations. Weather conditions are monitored before and during application. I've seen some people's plans where they've set as specific as every 30 minutes during applications. Um, as a company policy, we do not apply pesticides when wind speeds are over 8 miles per hour, when air pollution risk levels are high, and we um, put a metric in here that AQI, the air quality index, is greater than 201, or when there is an inversion layer. Very important, um, you know, because we have seen some uh, drift instances with inversion layers, both with both with phytotoxicity within the treated vineyard and outside of the vineyard. Oh, wow. so, yeah, that's not pretty. Avoid it. <laughs> <laughs> Timing of application. When possible, we apply pesticides during the night or in the early morning hours. And Steve's already talked about that. And then drift reduction adjuvants. The use of drift reduction adjuvants is considered as recommended by our PCA. So, Steve, I don't know, do people use drift reduction adjuvants? Is that common? Wait, can I do my one second pause here? Okay. <laughs> I, I, you know, I, I can't talk specifically about my competitors, but we use them commonly and most often. I mean, all of my herbicide, uh, all of our 
in vineyard herbicide applications, we use a uh, drift reduction um, adjuvant, which also has the added benefit of being a deposition age, another deposition aid. In other words, we get more active ingredient on the weed, so it actually enhances our weed control. So yes, I mean, uh, we we believe in them strongly, especially for herbicide applications, but we also do use them in many cases um, for insecticide applications. Okay. So. Awesome. So you could list um, any adjuvant pesticide combinations here if you wanted to, or you could just say they kind of how we did here that you use them when, when appropriate. Right. Fair enough. Yeah, and that you you're open to it. Um, and again, then we talk about our plan review and update schedule where you would um, sign off on the plan every year and write the review date and then you would include this in your set of documents for the auditor's verification. So do you have any questions about the spray drift dust, spray drift management plan? If you do, go ahead and type those in now. And while we're waiting for that, I was just going to uh, throw out another thought when it comes to weather conditions. Uh, this is another plan that we that I'm looking at. It says before we apply pesticides, our management watchfully monitors the weather via television news or web resources. Um, if there is any evidence of rain or wind, we will suspend all spraying or dusting operations until weather permits. So, just another thought when it comes to. It's it's partly about it's mostly about drift, but but at least in this case, you kind of lose to the fact that it if you make an application and it gets rained off in an hour or two or five, it probably wasn't effective and it was not a wise environmental or business decision. Right, and for those of you who are in Crush District 11, we do have quite an extensive weather station network, and we get daily weather emails. Um, those are you can sign up for those, they're free. Um, so if you are in Christ District 11 and you want to get on our weather email listserv, you can just send me an email and we can sign you up there. And I know there's similar weather station networks in other regions. All right. We don't have any questions on this plan specifically, but um, I do want to remind you that if you still need to attend a sustainable vision workshop, we will have one more workshop. Right now, we're looking at doing that workshop in Santa Rosa. Kent Reeves and I were able to see, um, touch base on the telephone the other day, and he's trying to set that up at Schoen Farm, I believe it's called, which is a really unique property in Santa Rosa area. And um, hopefully, we'll, we'll at least have the date for you before May 1st so that you can answer Lodi Rule Standard 1.1 appropriately. And we will try to have it the date um, in the next few weeks, have the actual workshop in the next few weeks. So um, email me if you need to, to um, attend a workshop so that we can get you on that, the list. Right now, we have six people from all over California on that list. You must be doing a great job. There's absolutely no question. <laughs> That's right. We're is, it. is anybody awake out there? We can we can see <laughs> that uh, that 83 yeah 83 percent of you are viewing us. So. <laughs> okay, so um, feel free to stay on as we write up Lodi Rules um, Plan 6.24, the Sprayer Duster Maintenance Plan. Or if you are too busy to watch this happen, it will be quick. But if you're too busy, you're also um, you can get the handout by the end of the day, which will have this information in it. So thank you so much for your attention. For those of you who want to stay and watch us, we will um, try to entertain you here. Are you ready to cut and paste? I'm ready to do this. <laughs> Okay, so first you have to go oh, to get the standard though. Okay, so that is lodirules.com. Okay, well, so much for instilling me. Here we go. Okay, refresh. Do you have another one? Light eye. Of course. I can get back to it. 
All right, so LodiGrowers.com works too, and then under the Lodi Rules tab, if you haven't been here, there's a lot of resources for you here. So under this Lodi Rules tab, we have Grower Resources, and apply. Um, there's some tips for application too, but really everything you need as a grower is under this Grower Resources page. So here um, you can get a copy of the a PDF copy of the standards. The, Current edition, you have your time frame, and then you have your peas list, your protected harvest certification manual, your protected harvest assessment application user guide, which gives you tips on how to fill out the um, online self assessment. And then hopefully, all of you know that once you're a grower, you can get one of these cool vineyard signs. You pay for those, but we already have them designed. Um, and here's the contact info for that. It really does make a difference in a region when you, when people, consumers drive through and they're seeing a sustainability message coming from the vineyards. We've, we've had- They're heavily discounted, so. <laughs> Are they? I don't even know Oh, I forget the price, but- They're not too expensive. No, they're reasonable because we've kind of contracted with Gary and, and he's got the templates for it. And they last a long time yeah. and they're really, uh, they really do make a difference. I think. All right, so we are going to grab these standards as a PDF so that I can uh, show you what standard 6.24 says. Okay. So, um, I'm trying to move this over. I'm going to go with a touch screen. Yeah. So what you guys can't see is that this great go-to webinar thing blocks my screen, so I can't. I don't have full access. All right. So let's see where we are here. Six point two zero. Sorry. I hope this isn't making you dizzy. All right. So we are going to copy and paste this into our plan. Okay. All right. So there is your standard sprayer duster maintenance plan. The farming operation where the custom applicator has a written and implemented sprayer duster maintenance plan containing a cleaning and maintenance regime for filters, pumps, control units, pressure gauges, nozzles, hoses, the power takeoff, booms and tanks, and a plan review and update schedule. So Steve, I hope you have an example of this to help us out over there. They don't have an example. <laughs> I do not have an example of it. I can tell you in most cases uh, what we have done is, uh, you're confusing me. I'm sorry. Uh, that's all right. Uh, it, you know, what we have done is created a checklist, if you will, uh, and that can be simply done with a Word document or an Excel document. And in most cases, we just built them ourselves. We walked around with the, the spray crew and said, okay, before you start the day, what should we do? Well, we should check the pressure in the tires, and we should check all the, make sure all the bearings have been greased, and we should make sure that all the, uh, uh, the belts are, are tight and have belt dressing, and check for leaks, and I don't know what else. But we've built a checklist, uh, you know, to, so that much like a uh, DOT driver's pre-trip inspection, so he has a has a list to work off of and go around and actually take that five minutes and make sure that there's air in the tires and the filters have been cleaned. Because it really doesn't make a difference, right? Well, you know, I, I always have this thing that people talk about sprayer calibration like it's a one-time event, and and it really isn't. It's an on it's an ongoing process, and. Um, so every day you should check those things, but while you're spraying, the reason we put pressure gauges on spray rigs is so that the driver has something to monitor while he's spraying. So that being said, uh, and I'm getting off topic, but that being said, a lot of this, this maintenance uh, can center around what we have here, but some of it uh, you will find in the... Uh, in the manual for your sprayer or duster, they will they will certainly give you things that need to be looked at and checked with some kind of frequency. Totally. So, 
Okay, we're going to start out with our goals. Um, it doesn't doesn't really say that you need to have goals in this plan, but it really is a good idea to have goals at the top of every plan. So, maintenance practices that keep our equipment in good working order and to properly calibrate our machines every time before application. Uh, sprayers and dusters. So to ensure proper working order of all sprayers, all sprayers and dusters. And what was the other goal? Um, that it worked the right way every time. Uh, we strive to strictly enforce maintenance practices that keep our equipment in good working order. So to train employees on the importance of properly working machines. That's a little more positive than strictly enforcing. Okay. To properly properly calibrate is a good word there because calibration is so important. To properly calibrate our machines before every use. Yes. Wow, that's great. Before every use. All right. So then what's our next heading up there? We have a cleaning and maintenance regime for all of those things. So um, let's say cleaning and maintenance regime is fine. All right. Yes, sir. So maybe we can just use some of this. I'm not supposed to directly copy them. Okay, so cleaning and maintenance regime as a heading. And then in this part, we'll make sure to hit all of those different items like filters, pumps, etc. So let's talk about this, Steve. I like the way they worded it here. The sprayers okay. after each use. So cleaning happens after each use. Both inside and out. Okay. We can't copy word for word. No, we can't. Okay. That's fine. Um, so I, I'll just read this to you. By thoroughly cleaning the sprayer, it minimizes any unintended mixing of chemicals and corrosion damage to the sprayer. Now, if I were writing a plan, that's well put. I probably wouldn't put that line in there. I already know why I'm doing it. So, but this is important. The sprayer, sprayer is flushed with water, and all the valves are checked for wear. So is water flushing the common? Method of cleaning mm -hmm. pressure? Absolutely. Pressurized uh, water? Not necessarily. Okay. And that's really important for mealy bugs and mites. Exactly. Now, as a PCA, I need to point out here, remember there are some herbicides that require something more than just one use. Yeah. Uh, so we have to be careful. I don't really want to go into that now. Personally, I, I don't think it's a good idea to use a for the same spray rig for herbicide spraying and insecticide spraying. I think you should probably have two different sprayers. But keep in mind that sometimes herbicides will release in an insecticide tank and the results are not what you're going to want. So there, I've given my, I've got, I'll get off my soapbox now. <laughs> That was great. It's good to know. So next we'll go to the filters. So what happens with the filters for maintenance? Well, on this plan, they say the filters are removed, comma, disassembled and cleaned. Any damaged parts are replaced. Uh, so these dead filters are removed from visually infected for damage to wear. I think that's fine. You can assume that damaged parts will be replaced. And replaced as needed. All right. What's next? Pumps. Pumps and pumps. Valves are checked for wear. Water valves are replaced. Ceiling rings are replaced as needed. Diaphragms are checked for cracks. The pump is greased. So valves on pumps are inspected and repaired as needed. As needed. 
I always like to put this here. We keep extra. Actually, mm. let's put this as a up here after cleaning. Um, we keep extra parts on hand for timely repairs. And that would be filters. This is a great idea, right? Yeah, it is. Filters, because when you're so busy, it's good to have those extra pieces on hand. Oh, yeah, nozzles. Because if you have it, and you're, you know, you can just fix the issue right then when you need to, especially during the busy harvest time, right? Yes. For that. I'm thinking they're more on um, harvesters, but this is for sprayers just for you. Okay. Valves and pumps are inspected and repaired as needed. What's next in our little thing up there? Control units. Okay. Well, what do we do with control units? Control unit is tested with water for no leaks. As leaks are present, parts are checked and changed as needed. The control unit is lubricated with water. And so control units are tested for leaks and kept lubricated for proper functioning. We don't even need to say that. Then. All right, next is pressure gauges. In this case, the pressure gauge is changed to ensure correct flow rate. Um, so is it like a calibration thing? Well, that is kind of a calibration issue. Do you calibrate pressure gauges? I don't know. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Oh, well, here's an here's an example. Um, so a simple way of controlling the pressure gauge is to mount a completely new set of nozzles. So you would do this when you mount a completely new set of nozzles, which are known to match the valves of the nozzle table. At a fixed working pressure, for example, three bars, the nozzle flow rate is calibrated with a measuring jug. If the flow rate of the nozzles matches the table value at this pressure, the pressure gauge is okay. So you do so calibrate it, I guess. Assuming yeah. that there's no variation in the nozzle, which is always a little variation. Well, you would have a window. Okay. And so pressure gauges are checked when new nozzles okay. are applied by measuring, oh, are installed by measuring flow rate and comparing it with a, this was a, a nozzle table. Yes, all the manufacturers make have this, uh, yeah. charts that, that tell you at a given, given pressure, you should get a certain flow through that nozzle. Perfect. Cool. So I'm going to say a manufacturer's, that might be confusing. Factors. And again, you can have your custom applicator if you use one, or whoever does your spraying help you with this plan too. Cool. You don't have to rely on just Steve and I. <laughs> okay, what are we on next? Nozzles? The boom is later here. We're just going to go in the order here. So next step is nozzles. Okay. What do we do with nozzles? The spray pattern and flow rate of the valves is usually checked using water. Any nozzles that spray irregularly or have a higher or lower flow rate will be replaced. Hmm. And I think it's fair to say we check the spray pattern a little bit. So nozzles are checked by visual observation during, a, how about before? Yes. Before and during applications and replaced as needed. Um, I think it's still worthwhile adding a second line. Okay. Um, that, uh, or have any nozzles that spray regularly or have a higher or lower flow rate will be replaced. So. Okay. Nozzle to repeat. Yeah, I don't think you've covered that. It, they're really called worn nozzles. And okay. worn nozzles are. So we could say, and worn nozzles are replaced as needed. Perfect. Um, and how about, let's go one step further, and let's say that um, applicators are trained on the importance of proper nozzle function, because that's really important. I think this is very important, and <laughs> as a practitioner, 
I'll, I'll tell a story a couple years ago. We were not watching the Apple data as closely as, as we should have. And we're trying to figure out why we had such a mildew problem in the field. And so we came out at night when the applicator was spraying, and I'm quite sure he was applying 100 gallons per acre as he was, was requested, but we could find a couple of clogged nozzles on each side of the, the sprayer, and nobody was paying any attention to it. So, wow. very, very important. Wow. Uh, so, at the risk of pissing off all the applicators out there, as a grower, Let's face it, it's in your best interest to make sure that they're, you know, like you would with any other service provider, make sure they're doing their job uh, like they should be. So well, how about we say this, applicators are trained on the importance of proper nozzle function and supervisors monitor this with surprise checks. Yeah, Does that sound too mean? Okay. Okay. Maybe just line at the bottom, but, you know, that we consult with our applicators. They're following these guidelines. Okay. Does that make so, sense? Yeah. How about we may we have good communication with our applicators on all cleaning and maintenance. Yeah. Okay. Next up after nozzles comes hoses. Uh -huh. Okay, what do we do with hoses? Well, I don't, uh, we do not have hoses on this table. <laughs> <laughs> hoses are, are checked frequently for wear uh, and replaced as needed. Okay, checked frequently for wear and replaced as needed. Perfect. Next. Next up are, is the power takeoff. PTO. In this case, the PTO shaft is lubricated and the guard check. That's a good point. Shaft is lubricated and what? And the guard check. There's a safety guard, guard around the power takeoff shaft. And guard is checked before mm -hmm. each use. When would you? Um, Regularly? No, before each use? Yeah. Okay. Before each use. Yeah, as as much as you can, write in the um how often the frequency of when you do these things because believe it or not, your applicator may want to know what you expect of them in these things. And then that way you're both held accountable for for the proper maintenance. Okay. And actually on this plan Oh. Okay. And he says all tubes and hoses are checked for damage when tightened and loose. So uh, I guess that replace slash tightened. Do you tighten a hose? We only tighten the hose clamps. So Okay. So and replace as needed. Hose clamps are tightened Correct. before each use. That's a good idea. I like it. All right. Some of this stuff you probably already think is common sense, but it's good just to have it written down. Okay. Next step is booms. And by the way, if you do it right, you only have to do it once. So uh, as far as plan writing, yeah. That's part of the beauty of this. You want to review it every year, but you don't have to rewrite it every year. And, and I think this is a very sound plan, so you could probably come back for several years and not change anything. Yeah, and just review it. Totally. Totally. Especially this one. And do we have rust prevention up top? Because... Well, what do we say for booms? Oh, oh that was all. Well, check. Uh, check for damage. Okay. Check for and there, are they weaver? There's no, a, a boom tube is really just... Like Maybe we'll put hoses, booms, yeah, or that. check for where hose clamps. Right, does the boom have clamps or anything? Well, the hose is clamped to the boom. Okay. So <laughs> Obviously, I don't know my sprayer. <laughs> Tanks, okay. That, what do you do for tank? That's a good point. Well, Tanks. we check, uh, we certainly want to check them. Use before it's used. And actually, 
He did not specify tanks here, but he said rust prevention, all metal parts except for rust and protective rust prevention. Oil and metal. Okay. And I would just, for tanks, I would say all tanks are checked for cracks and leaks before each use. Okay. Now, how do you rinse out your tank between your sprays? Like, do you rinse your tank? Well, generally, yeah, and yes, with water. So okay. you empty your spray tank and then you rinse it with water. And the proper way to dispose of that water is to spray the rinse water back on the end. After each use, um, by spraying out the out the rinse water, right. water appropriately, which means not just on the side of the road, right? Yeah. Or around the wellhead. <laughs> so, spray out the rinse water into the vineyard. By spraying out the rinse water in the treated vineyard. The treated vineyard. Okay, perfect. All right, tanks are checked for cracks and yeast. Tanks are emptied to rinse after each use by spraying out the rinse water in the tree of your block. Any other part of this plan that we need um, for the rust prevention? We put the water repellent rust prevention oil on. Okay, great. So then let's make sure we got everything. Booms tank. So now we need our plan review and update schedule, and this is just a copy and paste from your other plans. And um, maybe this plan is also reviewed in February. So that's perfect. All right. So there you go. A live plan writing. Less than 15 minutes, I think, that it took us to write this plan. So um, if you have any questions on this final plan, or if you have any questions in general, we still have six of you with us, yeah. so if you, let us know. We'll stay on the line for another five minutes or so. Um, feel free to ask us any questions, and we really appreciate your attention, and um, we had fun. Yeah, it was fun. <laughs> um, I was going to say, and absolutely, if you have any questions uh, that Stephanie can't answer, I'd be glad to. Thank you. <laughs> He's an honest one. <laughs> all right. So thank you all very much. And we will see you hopefully at the Lodi Rules Year End Recap meeting in January of 2018, if not before. With your certificate in hand. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Good Thanks, luck. Stephanie. Bye, guys. Thank you. See too. ya.